I'm sure a lot of Grace is taking notes. Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Shakira Simley. I am serving as the equity officer here at the uh, Emergency Ops Center um, at Moscone South. And we have been working very hard over the past couple of weeks with our Department of Public Health and our partners in the, in the ops team here to make sure that all of our housing providers have all the updated guidance that they need in order to keep our most vulnerable San Franciscans safe and healthy. Today, uh, we are happy to provide a webinar with the latest up-to-date guidance from the Department of Public Health. And today, you will hear from several folks. You will hear from Helen Hale, who is from the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development. She is now the lead for the Affordable Housing and Congregate Housing Task Force here at the EOC, which you all will be, she'll, you'll be hearing from her very soon. You'll also be hearing from Dr. Zay Malawa, uh, who is the Chief of the Information and Policy Guidance Group um, at DPH. And you'll also be hearing from Dara Papo um, from the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing. So today we know that there's tons of questions that everyone has. We're going to try our best to monitor the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll leave a short time for questions after the webinar itself. This webinar will be captioned. It also will be made available online. Um, we'll be sure to email everyone with that information afterwards. And lastly, we want to say thank you to each and every one of you for all the hard work that you're doing to make sure that our folks, whether they are living in an SRO or public housing or permanent supportive housing, has what they need to be safe and healthy in light of this pandemic. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the reins over to Helen Hale. And just as a point of order, we will be monitoring questions in the chat box. Everything that we can't answer today We'll be sure to capture all those questions and answer them at a later date. Thank you so much, and here's Helen. Afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to answer some of your questions. We, I do want to just emphasize that guidance um, is an evolving process um, as this pandemic changes and, and we are updating information on a regular basis. So the purpose of today's webinar is to you know, provide time for us to provide this updated guidance and to make sure that you get your questions answered by both the Department of Public Health and also Mayor's Office of Housing Community Development and the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing. Uh, our agenda today, as you'll see on the screen, is basically that we're gonna do sort of a case study and make sure that we take you through what an experience might be with someone with COVID-19, um, as well as providing some guidance uh, around preventing the spread and, and living with them, and then having some questions. So congregate housing settings include the SROs, permanent supportive housing, public housing, affordable housing, subsidized housing sites, shelter or transitional housing with private rooms, independent senior housing, and cooperatives. Again, Congregate living has shared bathrooms and shared kitchen and shared common spaces. So those are important uh, distinctions there. Are, we understand that a number of different types of sites will share some type of common space. Um, and it's important for folks to understand that not everything will have shared kitchens or shared bathrooms. Next slide. So the following is not included, however. Um, adult homeless shelters or navigation centers 24-hour drop-in centers, residential care facilities for the elderly, residential mental health or substance abuse disorder programs, uh, medical respite or long-term care. So please note that there will be diff there's different guidance for those specific types of settings. So this is for the first set on the first slide. Thanks. All right, I'm going to now pass it off to my colleague who will take you through some of the case study. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Dr. Malawa. Um, <clears throat> so what we want to talk about is first a case study regarding a COVID-19 um, patient. Um, so what happens when a patient is diagnosed with COVID-19? Uh, so first, I just want to remind um, the participants that um, in general, the majority of people who are diagnosed with COVID-19 um, can remain at home um, in isolation safely. Uh, the majority of people do not require any additional hospital support. So the only people who will be getting hospital support will be people who are having um, significant complications from the COVID-19 disease and, and need oxygen, for example, or other um, additional hospitalized setting support. Um, so when um, the average person is diagnosed with COVID-19, um, the facility in which they live will be notified that there has been a positive case from the Department of Public Health. Um, and the facility manager will get some guidance around um, how best to do cleaning and other things to reduce the risk of spread in their facility. Uh, the facility manager will not be getting the name of the COVID positive patient um, unless the, the patient has given permission that their name be released for the purposes of um, support and wellness. Um, <clears throat> the patient will need to remain in isolation away from other people uh, for seven days uh, since when their, their symptoms started, and they need to be clear of symptoms for three full days. Um, so once they've met both of those criteria, they have, um, it's been seven days from, since they first started having symptoms, and it's been 72 hours since all of their symptoms resolved. Once those two criteria have been met, then they no longer need to be in isolation. Um, we, for, we are treating um, persons under investigation, meaning people who have symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19 but haven't actually had a test or their test results are pending. We're teaching, treating them in the same way that we would treat somebody who is um, COVID-19 positive. Um, and then the last thing I would just mention in this case is that if there is a patient who ends up being COVID-19 positive, um, and there's a concern that they can't be safely isolated in their current housing setting um, and that they might be putting other people at risk, uh, then providers can contact the Department of Public Health. And there's a slide coming up which will show how to do that. Providers can contact the Department of Public Health to request an isolation hotel room for that, for those people. Um, so I think that it's really important that everybody on this call know that one of the most important things that we can all do as community members in San Francisco is try to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, currently, there is no vaccine and there is no uh, proven treatment for COVID-19. So the most important thing is just preventing infection. Uh, we can do that firstly by excellent hand hygiene. And by that, I mean washing our hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Um, and it's very important to recognize that we need to wash all surfaces of our hands uh, when we're doing those 20 seconds and while you're rinsing to use friction and not just put it under the water. That's the best way to remove um, any potential contaminants. Uh, we also need to cover our coughs and sneezes, ideally with something that is disposable like a tissue or a paper towel. Uh, but if that's not available, then on the inside of your elbow or the inside of a jacket, uh, but what you don't want to do is cough or sneeze into, for instance, your hand, because your hand is then going to touch a bunch of other surfaces and potentially contaminate those surfaces. Um, you want to have a lot of trash receptacles around so that if people are using tissues to cover their coughs and sneezes, they can throw them away immediately. Uh, we want people to stay at home if they're sick, even if they don't have cough, even if they don't have fever. If you have any kind of symptoms of cough or cold, we want you to stay at home until you are recovered. Um, and we want people to try and avoid touching their face because that is one of the most common ways that people can actually become infected with COVID. And then lastly, I know that often people will hear about this, this terminology, social distancing. Um, and what that means basically is that we need people to stay away from one another. Uh, COVID-19 is spread through what we call respiratory droplets. Those are droplets that um, are most of the time very, very small that are created when we're speaking, breathing, coughing, and sneezing. Um, sometimes those droplets can almost form a, what we call a bioaerosol, a very fine mist, and that mist can travel only so far. It can't travel more than six feet. And so if you stay more than six feet from somebody, then you will not be at risk for infecting them. And that is why we are recommending so strongly that people avoid groups um, and try and maintain a distance of six feet from other people, um, even, even if they're people that they normally interact with, but if they're people from outside of their household. 
Um, so again, I want to reiterate that if a resident has symptoms of cough or cold, even if they don't have symptoms that exactly match up with what the CDC um, says are the symptoms consistent with COVID, uh, which is fever, shortness of breath, and cough, even if people have a runny nose and nothing else, we want them to please try to remain separate from other people and then cover their face, especially people who are having symptoms. But the recommendation right now is that all people cover their face when they're around other people. Um, and that is as much for the individual who's covering their face as protection, but it also protects other people that they might come in vicinity with. Uh, if masks are available, then that would be great to use, but we recognize that there are not a lot of masks available. And so we're asking people to use simple face coverings like bandanas uh, when they're leaving the house. Um, and we need to frequently wash the face coverings because again, if those coverings become contaminated, then they can start to spread germs. And so we encourage people to use those. At this time, we're asking that N95 masks um, and other um, hospital type masks um, be saved for healthcare providers so that we can preserve our healthcare provider staff as we go through the pandemic. Um, we also recommend that staff cover their face whenever possible. Um, so staff should definitely use um, masks if they have them available, but if not, then cloth, fa cloth, cloth face covers are also wonderful. Um, if staff happen to have masks, uh, masks can be reused. Um, so we are not suggesting that people change their masks even daily. Uh, if you are lucky enough to have a mask, then we would want you to keep it until it becomes damaged or visibly soiled, um, or if it becomes uh, wet. Uh, inevitably, when you're wearing a mask, it's going to become damp from the moisture in your breath. Um, and so when you're not wearing your mask, we would like for the mask to be either hung in a place where it can dry, but not touching any other masks, or to be kept in a brown paper bag um, so that it can dry out while it's being contained. Uh, we are not asking people to store their masks in plastic bags because that might actually keep the moisture within the mask while it's being stored and cause damage to the mask. Um, with daily cleaning, um, we recommend that people continue to use the supplies that they've been using prior to the pandemic outbreak, but just increase the frequency of cleaning and particularly focusing on the surfaces that are often touched, like doorknobs, fridge handles, um, and uh, light switches. Uh, we also want to remind everybody the importance of washing their hands frequently before and after eating every time you touch your face, whenever you cough and sneeze, uh, whenever you are leaving or returning to the home and any other time is a great time to wash your hands. Oh, sorry, can you go back one? If staff get sick, um, it is also recommended that staff stay home until they are recovered and we would like for them to please meet those same two criteria which is that they need to stay at home until a seven days have passed since when they first develop symptoms and b 72 hours have passed since all their symptoms have resolved and that's for any kind of sickness cold and flu even if you personally have not been tested for covid or don't think you have covid we still want you to stay at home because uh, the symptoms of covid are so variable meaning that some people um, barely have any symptoms and are still capable of passing it on to others. And so any kind of sickness, please stay at home to protect others. Um, and so as I've already alluded to, um, if there is somebody in a congregate housing setting who has been identified as being COVID positive, the Department of Public Health will reach out to the building manager to let them know that there is somebody who has um, developed COVID in their housing facility. The Department of Public Health will give some guidance on cleaning and the Department of Public Health will also notify contacts, identify and notify contacts of the COVID positive patient. Um, the housing manager will not be given um, the name or any other personal identifying information of the patient unless the patient consents. Um, but even still, the Department of Public Health, even in the absence of specific identification of the patient, the Department of Public Health will work with residential managers to uh, ensure safety for all residents and staff. Um, I also want to mention that um, if somebody is being isolated because they have um, been identified as COVID positive, uh, we want to make sure that uh, they are able to receive the health care that they need. Um, as you can see on the slide, something that uh, staff can look out for um, is significant difficulty breathing. And by that, I mean like difficulty finishing a sentence um, because they're having so much shortness of breath. Uh, persistent pain or pressure in the chest. And so by that, I mean, if the pain or pressure is significant enough that the patient can't be easily distracted from it and it lasts for more than 10 minutes, that would be concerning. Uh, any kind of change in their mental status, if they're newly confused uh, or they are difficult to arouse, 
uh, if any part of their face or in particular their lips start to look dusky, blue or grayish, or, or any other significant change in their well-being, that should all trigger a 911 phone call. Uh, those are all the danger signs that indicate that that patient might need a higher level of care. Uh, if somebody is unwell, um, maybe doing more poorly than, than they were doing the day before, but it doesn't seem like an emergency, uh, we would encourage staff to uh, contact that person's provider to get better guidance. Um, and if that person doesn't have a provider, or if you suspect somebody in your facility might be sick uh, and they don't have a provider, then please call 311 um, and they can help identify the best way to get uh, medical support. I also want to note that on the CDC website, there's actually a symptom tracker um, and medical decision making guidance tool that can be either used by a patient or somebody taking care of a patient. And basically that tool takes you step by step uh, where you can um, put in exactly what symptoms the patient's having and the tool will let you know what would be the best medical advice at that time. So I can make sure that this group sends that link out um, to this invite list. Um, should I continue with the community rooms or do you, do you guys want to take that? Okay, thank you. Great, Helen Hale again. Um, so we recognize that there are essential uses of community rooms that um, most uh, affordable housing or SROs or any congregate living setting um, have that share things, but most especially um, cooking and food pantry kind of uh, scenarios. We want to increase the daily cleaning and sanitation of all the surfaces before and after every event. Um, you might want to consider scheduling a much smaller group of people in a community room at one time. Um, they need to maintain social distancing. Uh, it's very important that we not have groups uh, clustered together as they might normally be clustered together. Um, so that social distancing protocol, having those things posted in any kind of communal space would be an important feature uh, to ensure that folks remember it. People get distracted when they're doing their daily functions. Excellent. Um, so um, under um, my team, um, we are working very closely with the Department of Public Health and the uh, Department of Building Inspections to conduct regular thorough health and safety inspections of, of our buildings um, in support of the public health order. Um, those inspections include the common areas. Um, they're, they come through, they, they do have a uh, specific information standard uh, that we can share with each of you so you'll know what kinds of things that they're looking for. You're supposed to maintain a cleaning log uh, and to post the health orders and also to provide hand sanitizer in the common areas and, and soap at all communal sinks. Go ahead. Um, we have posted, my team has posted a contacting for us for those um, uh, housing providers that are having trouble with the cleaning and it's, it's not been going very well, um, or they're in need of additional support around that. Um, we do have uh, some services that we've procured from a janitorial um, service program, and they will provide up to one week of cleaning at, at free to you um, to sort of get the building on track. Um, the owner operator would sign an agreement regarding that. Um, and so that we get them to a certain level of cleaning and then the building itself will take over and need to maintain that same level of cleaning for the rest, remainder of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, if you are in need of janitorial uh, services, um, you may email our um, central email, cleaning services, EOC at sfgov.org. Uh, that, that is one way to contact us or to communicate with us if you're in need of those kinds of services. We do depend on Department of, of Building Inspections, the Department of Public Health to also identify buildings that are in need of those services. Next. Um, in addition, we are here at the EOC, um, have been purchasing additional cleaning supplies that are necessary for um, our buildings that they, maybe they're having trouble uh, locating those kinds of supplies because things have been in short, um, not, not available. Vendors have been running low on supplies or back ordered. So we have been able to get some supplies and we will be able to distribute to those folks if in fact they are in need of those because we wanna make sure that we have a certain level of cleanliness in all of the buildings. Um, deliveries will take place Monday through Friday uh, between 10 and four and by our uh, task force staff that are here. Um, you, are, you may make those kind of requests to the affordable housing EOC, sfgov.org. And there's also an intake form that we've attached here, but we will supply those contact information for that. Um, the kinds of supplies that we have, we 
added you some nice little pictures there, but we basically have um, PPE, both gloves and, and some masks. Um, we do wanna make sure that buildings, particularly those buildings that have congregate um, and really communal bathrooms and lot, need lots of cleaning, um, that we are able to provide some of the isolation masks for some of your staff to use, um, as well as bleach. We have some paper products and hand sanitizer. What uh, I do wanna say is that um, the intention when we send out any supplies uh, from a delivery from us, we provide with you instructions on how to use masks, how to keep them clean, and uh, the use so that we do not having folks use masks in such a high volume um, that in fact the mask would have done better for a longer period of time. We also provide you with specific instructions on how to mix to have the right cleaning uh, concentration. Um, for, ho for home isolation, um, you, oh, here's your, here's your slide. <laughs> so I, th I believe, <laughs> say I went over all of these with the specific about how to isolate and how to um, email for a request for consultation around that. Um, so really what we're looking for, for all of the tenants that are able to do home isolation is that they have their own bedroom and their own bathroom and then they're able to isolate at home. The, the issues that become much more prevalent is when there is a shared bathroom, shared kitchens, and, and they are not able to remain isolated and away from the rest of the population. Um, and again, we've provided you with the contact information. Then we've also provided here, and, and again, we will make sure you have, you're able to locate any of these in case you need more guidance, but we've given you all kinds of um, information from the Department of Public Health and, and CDC so that you actually have cleaning standard information, what that might look like, an intake form, all the public health orders, all information that you might need uh, to make sure that you and your staff um, are up to date on the, on the recommended guidance. Um, we are also working very hard here at the EOC to make sure that any information that we needed is actually translated um, so that if you are needing to post things in your buildings or you have other staff that are in need of a different language than English, that we have those things in the appropriate languages to support your staff so that the information can be provided appropriately. I don't, I, I am wondering if there are specific questions that folks might have. I think we have some from the chat. And yeah. I, think um, I can chat. go ahead and read out what we've seen in the chat so far. Um, and I think both Helen and Dr. Noah will be able to answer these questions. Um, so one question came in um, is what is the DH contact number if providers need to refer someone to a hotel room? Um, okay, so we are working on having one single number for you guys, um, and right now we don't have that. So the email um, that was on the slide, and I can definitely have the team send it out again, is the best way to reach out uh, for a room right now. Um, I expect in the next two weeks we will have both a phone number and even an online um, tool where you can request ISO beds, uh, but we just are um, getting those on board still. Um, I saw that there was also about three questions that were asking about what to do with patients who are not willing to adhere to the isolation standard that we're trying to put up or uh, who are trying to leave isolation against medical advice. Um, again, and I apologize because this is an unsatisfying answer, but that is one of the top priorities for the policy team um, here on the emergency activation team. Um, unfortunately, because that's going to require some very intricate guidance from uh, the sheriff's office, the mayor's office, the Department of Public Health, et cetera. It's going to take a little while for us to evolve a policy around that, but we are developing that and we should be able to message out to this group uh, what the guidance is on that by the end of the week or early next week at the latest. And apologies again for not having that as a great answer. Um, okay, those are the questions I've heard of so far. And so they would need that person in order for them to function in their unit. So that would mean another person would be in contact with the COVID-19 and whether or not that person would be better off in a different setting than in that setting. Um, not necessarily. So the question was if people um, have been diagnosed with COVID um, and they have um, the space within their congregate housing setting to be able to isolate, um, but they um, at baseline receive support from in-home health care, um, should the in-home health care service continue to work with them. Um, and at this time, uh, we think that that is important. We want to make sure that people who are COVID positive continue to get all of their medical needs met. 
um, those medical needs that are related to COVID and those that are not. Um, again, we will be posting guidance uh, for in-home healthcare support uh, before the end of the week about how to take care of COVID positive patients while maintaining their own safety. So I would not recommend uh, um, that we would cancel in-home healthcare services, but rather we need everybody to be using universal precautions with some additional precautions for people who are gonna have close contact with COVID positive people. And again, please look for that guidance by the end of the week. Um, and I can also message the team to ensure that that actually gets pushed out to this group. Are there any other questions? This is Diana Alonzo with the Mission SRO Collaborative. And um, we were given the clinical consult number and I'm wondering, um, we, we had one of our staff call to see what the call process was like, but there doesn't seem to be any uh, language function around Spanish. Is that something that's coming? Um, I don't want to tell you fake answers, so I don't know, but I can try and get back to you. We recognize very much that it's an equity issue that we have adequate language capacity. Um, but again, there are so many things that we're trying to move forward at once. Um, definitely one of them is interpreter and translator contracts. And so um, I will definitely flag that as an issue that's coming up um, to see how we can get some support. Um, and sorry that I don't have a better answer. No worries. Um, and I have a follow up question. In, in the mission, uh, we had two cases um, where we had um, tenants from two different hotels that, that tested positive and they were sent home to quarantine in the hotel. Um, and then one, uh, one case, they actually got much worse. And then the second case, uh, we proceeded with a referral to uh, an isolation hotel. And then that on, on the tenant side, that fell through. But what do we do when tenants are being sent back to the SRO to quarantine because the, the hospital is telling them go back to the SRO but we're also hearing they should be in isolation because they're in congregate settings. Yeah, so definitely um, please use that, um, that email um, to request an isolation bed. We're trying to develop some better protocols um, before patients get discharged to try and prevent that from happening. But again, this is like a very quickly evolving situation and so we are not yet 100%. So in those instances where, where we missed it, then I would encourage you to please um, request an isolation bed um, using that email address. Oh, I okay. It is, the email address is COVID19ISOrequest at sfdph.org. So again, COVID19ISOrequest at sfdph.org. Um, I saw a couple of questions um, in the chat box. So supplies are going out, um, but they have to be re re um, requested. So if you have put in a request, we are starting to fill them and the deliveries are starting to happen this week. You're free to reach out to the cleaning services um, EOC uh, at SFGov or the affordable housing EOC at SFGov to check on if you've made a request and we're filling it, we are communicating directly with each building when we've gotten a request that comes in. There is an intake form on that because we've gotten requests from things without proper enough information to actually make a delivery. So we would request that um, you use the forms that are available uh, for, for that. Um, I, what, I, what I can say, and I, I think you, um, have, you, you saw this, is that this is a, it's evolving and we're learning as we go. There are um, a number of different contact points that um, your tenants may um, be talking to in terms of providers that uh, may not be uh, a DPH facility. And so we are still trying to sort of coordinate when you have a, a tenant that um, is diagnosed with COVID-19 positive, um, it is possible that those uh, tenants would not be in the DPH system. And so that's part of the challenges of sort of navigating, um, being able to communicate directly with you. It's not that we don't want to communicate with you, it's that we might not be being notified. And so we're trying to sort of close all those gaps. But we do want people to get the supplies that they need. So I encourage you to send in your requests to fill out the intake form. We wanna get supplies out to you. We wanna, we certainly will share all the communication around how to use the masks and how to work on the cleaning supplies, all those kind of details will be, will be sent out to this uh, webinar as well as to our much broader um, list. That's how you all 
found out about the webinar, so we have the correct contact information. Um, and we'll make sure that you um, have all of those documents so that you can use them for reference um, with your staff. Other questions? Helen, I see a question in the chat about the janitorial contracts. Yes. And asking if they're only for buildings that do not already have existing Is that right? So we are we are very much gearing the janitorial contracts to primarily buildings who ha, ha, are having trouble passing uh, health uh, the health and just they're not they're not able to pass inspections. Um, and make sure that those buildings are our first uh, task. But if you have a, if you have concerns about your building or you need assistance and support, you're welcome to reach out to us and have a conversation about that. In addition, we want to be able to have some flexibility to be able to deploy extra support to buildings if in fact they start to have um, some COVID positive cases and that in fact they need additional cleaning and support and their current staff are not able to uh, provide enough cleaning at the rate that's necessary to, in order to sort of stay on top of it to slow the spread. Hi, this is Laura with Dolores Street Community Services. We yes. operate Casa Quesada, a 52-unit uh, residence. Yes. And my question is, uh, uh, as noted, we would receive notice from DPH that a COVID-19 uh, positive resident is returning to our facility and my question is we're not a medical facility and we have multiple floors multiple residents how can we properly care for somebody that's being released from the hospital back to an SRO where we know that the 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 uh, manifestation of going from normal to an emergency situation can happen literally overnight. Um, I know of a case where um, a COVID positive uh, patient was released on Saturday and on Sunday night, they were having a heart attack. Um, again, if, if, we have, if we have residents that are alone in their room, how can we properly care for them if we're not a medical facility, nor, nor are we going to be able to um, pay any closer um, attention or care since we don't know who the patient is? Um, so thanks for your question. Um, I, I want to A, just reiterate for the whole call that the vast majority of people who end up COVID positive do not require hospitalization and do not end up requiring really high levels of care. And so because we need our hospitals to be available to take care of the people who do require care. We cannot keep people in the hospital who are able to monitor at home. And so in the same way how we are discharging people who live alone, not in SRO settings, home to self-monitor, we're going to have to discharge patients who are well enough to self-monitor back to SROs. There is not an expectation that, that congregate housing staff are going to be providing medical care for patients. The kinds of patients who are being discharged home are the patients who when they get discharged, there's the expectation that they can provide self-care. There is always the possibility that people who were initially doing well start to get uh, more sick. And there's no way that medical staff um, can predict that prior to discharging people. And so in the same way that if somebody lives alone and they get discharged from the hospital back to their apartment, they're going to have to rely on the community and family members and themselves to kind of escalate care. We're going to have to rely on residents to manage their own care, but there's not an expectation that staff will manage that for them. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add to that at all? Or? So I think the other piece that, that I have been hearing quite extensively, um, both by phone and, and email, is that um, we have to remember that when folks go in and they're talking to their healthcare provider and they, there is a set of questions that's asked of uh, the person, that does try to get to the deep information of, of what their living environment is. Um, unfortunately, a bit of that, because that there is the privacy component of a healthcare provider and the um, patient, there is a bit of reliance on the fact that that person is able to provide enough information for them to make a recommendation as to where they should go. And so that's part of the reason we're trying to close the loop uh, between notification so that the buildings will know when someone has identified that they are capable of being able to isolate or quarantine in their building because they have the private bathroom in their own uh, room and that they can provide for their own basic needs such as food 
um, and that they have some medication to be able to manage fever and things like that. Um, oftentimes, uh, persons may be doing well and then things escalate, but it is not our intention for you as the property manager to be necessarily providing that support. We are hoping that a number of the folks that are able to that they're able to be connected to folks that can deliver food or that there can be someone that is able to check on them by phone and that they're not gonna be completely isolated. We understand that that is not always the case, but that is what is oftentimes shared. And so we're trying to come up with appropriate guidance that sort of covers these other scenarios that are happening. And as this is starting to develop, we're starting to become much more aware of the variety of different circumstances that are happening. I believe there's been a couple of other questions um, that I can um, sort of try and, and, and get us through. Um, so I, I appreciate the question around what might, if we were be providing housing uh, for the services staff that are in these buildings that are, are helping to support these folks so that they're not traveling home to their own homes um, and infecting their own families. Um, we are certainly are investigating the different aspects of how treatment of COVID-19 positive impacts our much broader base of essential service workers, which is all of you all in your buildings that are providing that care. Um, and we do not have answers for those kinds of things at this point. What I can say to you is that it's very important uh, that you practice the social distancing, that you are washing your hands, that you are following all of the tenants that are necessary um, to be able to prevent that disease. Uh, from spreading. So there are specific steps and it's important that you follow those things and that you don't step into a room and get in close contact or try to provide those kinds of, you, you, if there's a need for a higher level of care, one should, would should be calling their medical, their health provider or 911. Um, so I know that, I know that sometimes um, not being able to step in and be supportive, as you all always are on a regular basis, it's harder to do that, but you have to do that from a safety perspective first. Um, in addition, any kind of other questions that come in about this cleaning supplies and uh, questions that you might have about postings of things, please reach out with those specific emails, the EOC emails, that if you're requesting things from, from us, because we want to get those uh, supplies out to you as quickly as possible. Um, there's a clarifying question here about the in-home supportive services mm -hmm. question that was previously asked, um, and is that are people who are unable to ride their own ABLs are they considered able to self-isolate? So people who can't go about their own activities. I would imagine. So, so, so our so again, I, I just want to I want to clarify. I think we would say that if a person is not able to care for themselves without an in-home supportive care provider doing their regular daily tasks with them that we understand um, that that person most likely needs to, to be in, in, a, in a place where they can have some supports. Um, unfortunately, the patient though may represent to their doctor that they're in good shape because they're used to being in their own home environment and they also might prefer to be in their home environment. So those are the kinds of situations that we're still trying to clarify in terms of how do we create a good triage system to prevent someone from discharging and coming home and then actually needing another person um, to be able to do their regular daily task. We're, we're trying to sort of sort out those kinds of complicated situations, which I'm very aware of are happening in many of your buildings. Other questions? Uh, I see a question in the chat um, from someone who is asking what they can do if someone in one of their Things in a unit COVID to protect the other people. So, so the question that um, was just repeated from chat was that um, if they have, if you have identified COVID nineteen positive uh, tenant in your building, what can you do to prevent the other tenants um, from um, becoming infected? So again, um, I can't emphasize enough the need to clean your buildings at a at a higher rate. Than the way you have normally been cleaning your buildings. Um, if you know that there has been um, a COVID positive in your building, you want to ramp up the cleaning of all common spaces. You want to encourage all the tenants to maintain the social distancing, make sure that folks are following the precautions, the washing of the hands, all of those things to, to as, as well as humanly possible. Um, that means that, for instance, doors, 
the doorknobs, the rails to open the doors, the railings on stairs, the pushing the buttons in the elevator. If you have a common laundry room, then make sure that you're wiping down the laundry room. So every single touch point that a, a tenant might encounter needs to be cleaned and that the person that's in the building, again, they're in quarantine, which means that they're not, they're not coming out. I do wanna recognize that we have not presented any guidance yet on community laundry facilities. We're very aware of that and we're really working on coming up what is the, with the best guidance for how one would manage the community um, laundry facilities, particularly if you have people that are isolating or, or in quarantine in your building and how one could manage uh, making sure that a person has clean laundry. Um, we are still sort of sorting through the different aspects of that. Um, also that a lot of cases now of people who are asymptomatic are still transmitting, which is that even if you don't have COVID positive, you still need to. So, so I, I, and I've just been reminded, and I, I think this is a point that it's, it's hard for us to remember these things because we are feeling fine. Um, but there, we know that a, a lot of folks potentially are positive, but are, have no symptoms. And so therefore, you're conducting your daily life without necessarily taking the extra precautions. That's why um, it is very important to maintain that, that social distancing, to make sure that you follow, you're not touching your face, that you are washing your hands, that you are following all of these protocols. And it, whether or not you are sick, everyone needs to be doing these kinds of things. Uh, I, I will give a, a fun example here at the EOC. We, we call them their air, airplane arms, where everybody's arms are out to the side and you spin around and you make sure that you are nowhere near touching anybody whatsoever and they're spinning too. So you're six feet apart. So you must conduct all of your conversations that far apart from each other and, and that you are really working hard to wash your hands all the time. It, way more than you would normally wash your hands. Um, it's really important to make sure that you're doing these things and that you're cl cleansing all surfaces and you're wiping things down. Uh, these are the kinds of things that will really reduce the spread of the disease because we can't track everybody that's positive because some people don't have symptoms and it's important to recognize that. Other questions? Yes, I have a, a question about going back to the earlier comments about working with residents who are not willing to adhere. The comment was made that uh, this was involving some things having to do with the sheriff's department and uh, public health. And uh, I think the easiest way to do this is who is actually working on developing that messaging? Uh, because I would like to make certain that a couple things are actually covered in the document that comes out at the end of the week. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I didn't, I wasn't quite sure. Uh, is this Dave that was speaking? Uh, no, this is Richard that was speaking. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not, I don't see the chat, so it's, it, I mean, or I, I'm not, it's not on my screen like that, so I apologize. Um, so um, I'm more than happy if you all want to direct um, communication directly to me. Um, I, I'm sitting on those panels and, and coming up with the, the guidance. I'll be a part of that conversation. I, I will assure you that I am more than aware of folks that won't comply with recommendations in, in housing buildings. I spent most of my life <laughs> managing those kinds of things, but I, I'm more than happy to, to have a conversation or an email exchange with some recommendations that anyone might have um, okay. re regarding yeah. all those things, because I'm, I'm interested in hearing sort of some of your strategies, because we know that it takes, it's more than law enforcement and, and that kind of thing. I, I understand that. And, and my, yeah, for those you. people that, don't have you can certainly send us the, the published emails in, in there too but my email is pretty straightforward helen h-e-l-e-n dot hale h-a-l-e at sfgov.org and i'm more than happy to have anybody reach out to me directly i i will respond great thank you very much helen. no problem i appreciate it hi this is laura again there's a number of questions that are coming up on the chat that have to do again with how do we ensure the safety of our residents you know, personally, I'm deeply concerned if we're going to be sending back COVID-19 patients back into the SR into our SROs, why can't they be given a hotel room? And 
in, in within our unit at Casa Quesada, we have people with uh, compromised immune systems. So if we're going to be returning folks who are COVID-19 positive to, to, um, to our housing, then we need to be moving those people with compromised immune systems and other chronic illnesses over 60 who are very vulnerable into the hotel rooms. But it is irresponsible to set it up where we know how contagious COVID-19 is. And as soon as somebody's touching that surface, we're not going to be able to immediately clean after every single person touches common areas. It's just not, um, it's just not the kind of guidance that seems sound and reasonable given how contagious COVID-19 is. So I, I completely appreciate your concern and, and your anxiety, particularly for your much larger population. And, and we share those concerns, to be quite frank. I think that there are a number of factors that enter into the guidance that we give. One, there are a limited number of hotel rooms that are available. And so we do need to reserve those hotel rooms for folks who um, have additional needs um, that cannot be supported uh, in their current setting. Um, in addition, we are trying our very best to be able to identify which uh, living environments would not be conducive to having a person be able to quarantine or to be, on, on, be there with whatever support that they identify to us that they are able to have. I, I do I do want to emphasize a little bit here that there you have to remember that their conversation is taking place between a patient and their care provider. And there that is the conversation that's happening. And, and we do we're not able necessarily to require or to do anything until a person is no longer able to make those decisions. And so we are doing our very best to provide the very best guidance and to be able to support and have a person go to the very best place available for them. But there are only so many hotel rooms available and there is sort of a combination of things that need to happen. It is certainly not our desire to send somebody back with, with the understanding that by their presence alone there that that's going to you know, encourage more infection. That's why we're really encouraging it. It takes everybody, all of the residents in the building, everybody in, a, in any kind of housing has to cooperate. And so I appreciate the conversations with folks who are saying, in fact, people won't ag agree or compromise. I, 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 I don't want to underplay or down or, or make anybody feel like we're not hearing you. I, I, there are just a lot of different factors that are involved. And so the best guidance is to make sure everyone is doing their part and that we are helping to create a coordinated response with all of the medical providers and that we're able to identify those folks most at risk to return to their setting, both for their own health, but also for the welfare of the other folks that are living there. Well, and then I've been reminded with the fact that if, if we were to keep, uh, if we were to hospitalize folks um, because there was no other place for them to go, it would mean that we then have no hospital space for someone who is in extreme uh, danger and really needs the hospital bed. And so we're trying to create a priority system. I'm sure it's not perfect. Um, we're doing our very best. And I think as we begin to have a flow and we start to understand these, um, the problems that are coming up, we will create guidance and support and figure out the best that we can. Again, there's just some limited supply. Are there additional questions that we can be answered here? I want to remind folks that we will be providing all of this out to the group and that we will also um, be providing updates and guidance and all of the information. And if we don't have it in languages yet, you can be assured that we will be updating it. Um, I also want to remind folks that I have started sending out a, a weekly email on Fridays that provides updated information um, this webinar came in it as well, and we will be updating and providing communication with you on a regular basis. That does not mean that you need to wait for a weekly update. We will be getting things to you as they come out, if, should the guidance come out before Fridays. But we do want to create a regular information flow to you so that you are connected to the different things that are happening at the city. We also have our emails for folks to ask questions. Um, I've provided my um, email as well. We want to be in close partnership with you because we know that you all are essential to being able to have people be able to shelter in place at home. Uh, and we thank you for that. I think that about brings us close to the end here. We will be providing updates if there are questions that we come across in the chat that did not get answered. 
Um, we are more than happy to provide that. We will be responding to those questions and provide guidance to you. Um, if you want to be on any kind of um, mailing list and you think you might not be on that, um, you just can email the affordable housing EOC uh, at SFGov. And it really is just that, affordable housing EOC at sfgov.org. I think that about sums up our meeting and we wanna thank all of you for taking the time to joining us today. Thank you again. Thank you.